They laughed in the beginning, not quietly, not behind closed doors, openly, confidently, and with that brand of European engineering smugness that had been cultivated through centuries of craftsmanship. When the idea was first whispered that the Americans, those automobile builders, those mass production fanatics, would attempt to copy the Rolls Royce Merlin engine, the reaction across engineering shops in Britain, Germany, and even among neutral observers followed the same pattern a smirk, a shrug, and the same dismissive sentence spoken in a dozen accents. Americans build refrigerators and Buicks, not superchargers, not aircraft engines that could dance with the laws of physics, not engines that could inhale thin, freezing air at 30,000 feet and still roar like a myth awakened, not engines that determined the life or death of nations. But the world was about to discover that America faced a problem no one else could solve quickly. The skies over Europe were bleeding pilots, bomber crews, and machines faster than replacements could be shipped. Something had to change, and that change arrived not in a boardroom or a battlefield, but in a quiet Detroit factory owned by a company most people assumed made only luxury cars for men who drank martinis and argued about tailfins. Packard, the last name anyone expected to rewrite the physics of war. When the British delegation arrived in Detroit in 1940, their expectations hovered not far above zero. They had dealt with American industry before, brilliant, fast-moving, enthusiastic, but often sloppy in the details that separated brilliance from disaster. And the Merlin, for all its glamour, was fragile perfection. Every piston, every valve, every drop of oil had to operate together like components in a symphony. There were engineering firms in Europe that refused to even attempt copying it for fear of embarrassment. So when Packard agreed to produce it, and produce it quickly, the reaction was predictable. It's impossible. They'll ruin it. They'll simplify it until it stops being a Merlin altogether. In Berlin, the reaction was even more condescending. German engineers laughed outright. To them, American engines were tractors. Big, loud, simple, and perfect for hauling grain but not for slicing through icy stratospheric air while feeding a two-stage, two-speed supercharger. American factories were powerful, yes, but not precise. Industrial giants, not watchmakers. One Luftwaffe colonel summarized it perfectly over brandy. I would rather trust a Bavarian farmer to tune a Stradivarius than an American to copy a Merlin. And so the engineers laughed. Pilots laughed. Even some of the British quietly doubted. But the men at Packard didn't laugh. They rolled up their sleeves. Dash dash dash. The Merlin engine was, by every definition, beautiful. Not aesthetically. Its blocky aluminum form was not meant for magazine covers, but mechanically, spiritually, mathematically. It was an engine that shouldn't have worked as well as it did. It pushed limits that other engineers described as suicidal. It ran hotter than hell, operated at pressures that made mechanics sweat, and transformed aircraft like the Spitfire from elegant flying machines into lethal predators. Yet the Merlin had a problem. Britain couldn't build enough of them. Their factories were bombed their supply chains fragile, their workforce exhausted. They needed an industrial powerhouse, one untouched by war, to carry the burden. And so the responsibility fell to Packard, who agreed not to build a Merlin, but to build thousands. The first time Rolls-Royce engineers toured Packard's facilities, they were stunned. Floor after floor of automated machinery, conveyor belts, gauges, and stamping systems moved with mechanical choreography. Packard didn't just build car engines, they built them by the tens of thousands with precision most European firms couldn't match. But that didn't calm their doubts. The Merlin required handcrafted finesse. It needed tolerances so tight that a hair's width could mean a blown cylinder at full throttle. Packard's obsession with standardized tooling, replacing artisans with machines, felt insulting to British engineers who had spent their lives polishing valves by hand. The first meetings were polite but icy. You simply cannot mass produce perfection, the British warned. Packard's chief engineer, Jesse Vincent, responded with a smile that carried more confidence than arrogance. Gentlemen, you misunderstand. We do not mass produce imperfection. We mass produce precision. And thus began one of the most remarkable engineering marriages of the 20th century. Dash dash dash. The copying process was agonizing. Rolls Royce shipped detailed blueprints so detailed they bordered on obsessive. Every line mattered, every angle mattered, the Merlin was a beast with mood swings, treated wrong and it would devour its own internals. 
Packard engineers began measuring the British parts and discovered something strange. Many didn't match the blueprints exactly. Rolls-Royce built engines the way master artisans built violins, adjusting, compensating, improvising. That was unacceptable in Detroit. Packard's first major decision shocked the British delegation. They ignored half the blueprints. Instead, they re-measured every single component with high-precision American gauges and recreated the entire engine with repeatable, machine-cut tolerances. Where Rolls-Royce used hand-ground valve seats, Packard replaced them with machined inserts. Where Rolls-Royce relied on manual polishing, Packard used automated honing rigs. Where Rolls-Royce eyeballed gasket fittings, Packard designed proprietary machines to standardize every seal. The result, the Packard Merlin wasn't just a copy. It was a re-engineered masterpiece. The British didn't know what to think. They still doubted. They still anticipated disaster. Meanwhile, Germany remained blissfully unaware. Dash dash dash. The first Packard Merlin test run in late 1941 shook the entire facility. The engine roared to life not as a prototype, not as a hand-picked showpiece, but as a fully Packard built production unit straight from the assembly line. Engineers gathered around it like priests at a sacred altar. The instruments told the truth. Smooth, stable, powerful, with intolerances tighter than Rolls-Royce had ever achieved. One British engineer removed his glasses, rubbed his eyes, and muttered something that would echo through the entire program. Bloody hell. They've improved it. Yet still, no one imagined what 55,000 of these engines would soon do. Dash dash dash. Across Germany, the tone had not changed. Intelligence reports suggested that America would attempt to build the Merlin, and the reaction remained laughter coated in arrogance. What will they do? One Luftwaffe engineer joked, put Whitewall tires on it. The Luftwaffe believed they had time. They believed American industry was too slow. They believed the war would be decided long before Detroit could produce anything meaningful. They were wrong on all three. Packard didn't just build engines. They unleashed a tidal wave. Factories expanded. Assembly lines multiplied. Workers were trained with motion picture tutorials, machine printed manuals, and standardized tooling that eliminated guesswork. Every day, Merlin engines poured off the line with the consistency of bottled milk. It was the world's first true mass production of a high performance aircraft engine. And the moment those engines met the right airframe, history cracked open. Dash dash dash. The P-51 Mustang was a good plane with a bad heart. Its original Allison engine performed respectably at low altitude but suffocated during high-altitude escort missions. Pilots loved the Mustang's aerodynamics but cursed its lack of power above 15,000 feet. The British knew the solution. Strap a Merlin onto it. The Americans resisted at first, not from pride but logistics. Rolls-Royce couldn't provide enough Merlins even for Spitfires. How could they supply engines for an entirely new fighter fleet? Enter Packard. They had engines, thousands of them, all waiting for a purpose. The moment the first Packard Merlin powered Mustang took off, the world changed. Test pilots returned with grins that stretched wider than the airfields. It climbs like the devil. It accelerates like a falling star. It turns the sky into our home. When the P-51B, powered by a Packard V-1650-3, throttled up its two-stage supercharger and screamed beyond 30,000 feet without the slightest hesitation, engineers realized something profound, this wasn't a fighter. It was a sky-dominating weapon unlike anything the Allies had fielded before. American pilots had a new bird. The Luftwaffe had a new nightmare. Dash dash dash. The first German pilot to encounter a Merlin-powered Mustang didn't even know what he was looking at. He was escorting a bomber formation over the Ruhr when a sleek silver blur flashed past him and shredded his wingman before he could blink. He described it in his report. It climbed like a rocket and dived like a hawk. I have never seen such a machine. High command dismissed him. A fluke. A lucky shot. Nothing to worry about. Until more reports came in. Then dozens. Then hundreds. Something new was in the sky. Something very fast. Something that followed bombers all the way to Berlin, and then all the way back. That something was running on Packard Merlins. Dash dash dash. By early 1944, the Luftwaffe was being crushed not by numbers but by performance. German fighters, once the masters of the skies, 
couldn't match the Mustang's altitude, speed, or endurance. Missions that previously saw bomber losses of 20% dropped to near zero. German aces, the pride of the Reich, found themselves outclimbed, outturned, and outrun. Their once invincible FW 190s and BF 109s suddenly felt sluggish and blind. The sky, which had been Germany's hunting ground for years, now belonged to someone else. A Luftwaffe general, in a moment of bitter honesty, told his staff, We are not fighting the Americans. We are fighting Detroit. Every Merlin that rolled out of Packard's factory meant another Mustang escorting another bomber deep into the Reich. Every Mustang meant fewer German fighters returning to base. Every day, the Luftwaffe shrank, not in numbers, but in hope. And still the Packard engines poured in. Dash dash dash, Packard refined the Merlin further. Improved metallurgy, enhanced coolant passages, fixed issues Rolls Royce had simply accepted as quirks. Introduced interchangeable parts that eliminated entire maintenance nightmares. Rolls Royce quietly admitted that Packard's Merlins were often more reliable than their own. By mid war, Packard had built tens of thousands. By war's end, 55,000 Merlins had left Detroit. 55,000 screaming, supercharged, high altitude, precision engineered lungs pumping oxygen into fighters that suffocated the Luftwaffe's last chance of victory. The Germans were no longer laughing. Dash dash dash, one of the most telling moments came from a German engineer captured near Normandy. When interrogators asked him when he knew the war was lost, he didn't mention Stalingrad or El Alamein or the Allied landings. He replied, when your Mustangs began escorting your bombers all the way to Berlin, and home again. We knew then that our skies, were no longer ours, that realization came courtesy of Detroit. Dash dash dash, Packard's contribution was not glamorous. They didn't build the airframes. They didn't fly the missions. They didn't drop the bombs or fire the guns. But they gave the Allies the one thing Germany could no longer match. Air dominance. The Mustang could only be as good as the heart inside it, and that heart was a Packard Merlin. Without it, the Luftwaffe would have survived another year. Maybe two. Without it, Allied bombers would have continued dying in swarms. Without it, D-Day might have been postponed or jeopardized entirely. With it, the sky became an Allied highway. German production collapsed under bombing raids that would have been suicide runs without fighters to shield them. German fuel reserves dwindled, factories burned, and pilots were shot down before they could even begin training new recruits. You could hear the rumble of Packard Merlins from London to Warsaw. From Normandy to Berlin, from the hearts of grateful pilots to the nightmares of German engineers who once laughed at Detroit. The laughter stopped the moment the engines started.